Welcome to everybody. Um, we are just a few minutes past the hour, so I'm going to go ahead and get started so that um, Desmond has the full hour to do his thing. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. As you come in, just continue to put that info in the um, chat. That just helps Desmond a little bit and interesting as well to see who's all here. So thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Jenna Nilo. I'm the Director of Marketing and Outreach with Illinois Digital Educators Alliance. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so happy to have one of our partners, Next Wave STEM, with us today and Desmond, who has been um, so gracious to join us for a Wednesday webinar. Um, he has done some previous fabulous ones, and uh, as he said, he recognizes some names, so he's clearly got a, uh, a posse of followers, so we're glad you're all here. Um, before I turn things over to Desmond, uh, just a few quick housekeeping items. Um, do me a favor and go ahead, keep yourself muted today, um, and if you do have questions, comments, um, anything like that, we definitely welcome interaction, um, but we're gonna ask you to use that chat window to do so today. So I will be uh, helping monitor that chat, and every once in a while, I will pop in to interrupt Desmond with any of your questions. So please put them in there, and I will be watching that and then making sure that everything gets answered. Um, also, if you don't mind keeping your video off, that way um, Desmond will be the spotlight video today. So I'm going to do the same thing in just a second. I'm going to um, mute myself and turn my video off so that he's got the floor. Um, but that just kind of helps keep everything focused on him and today's presentation. So that would be awesome. Um, if you're looking for PDHs today, um, Illinois educators uh, can earn one PDH for live attendance today. At the end of the session today, in that chat window, I am going to put a link for um, PDHs for today's session. So you'll just need to click that link before the end of the day, before midnight, and fill out the information. Um, there's a little bit of email back and forth that happens, um, and that will get you your certificate of completion and evidence. If you just are looking, if you're out of state um, and looking for that certificate of completion for today, do the same thing, fill it out, and we'll get you that certificate of completion so that you can give it to whomever um, to get credit for your live attendance today. Um, I think that's it. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Desmond. Desmond, thanks so much for joining us today. Really looking forward to this. I know that this is so timely. People are putting in that um, they are starting the first quarter in a remote learning situation. So I know that um, there is going to be lots of information. Before I turn things over, Carolyn, I just caught that out of the corner of my eye. Yes, I forgot to mention, we are recording. Um, so around 8 a.m. tomorrow, um, possibly end of day today, depends on how quickly, um, I will be sending out a link to the recording, the chat file, and then um, any resources, including the slides that Desmond is so gracious to share with us. So all of that stuff will be coming in an email to everybody who registered, so you will for sure get it. Um, so that's all. I'm going to turn myself off. Desmond, welcome. Thank you. And uh, let us know if you have any other questions. I'll be checking that out. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenna, and thanks to IDEA uh, for having myself and having Next Wave STEM as an organization uh, on the chat today. Um, I also want to piggyback off that last bit of housekeeping. Yes, um, we're recording, but I will also make the slides available. So, uh, Jenna, if you want to send those out in addition with that email, um, you are more than free to do so. Uh, my name is Desmond Martin. I'm the program coordinator for Next Wave STEM. Uh, and one of the many things that I do at Next Wave STEM is to manage our professional development outreach. Uh, at Next Wave STEM, we are a startup company that focuses on STEM education K through 12 um, for students who are interested in emerging technologies. Um, that means things like coding drones to fly autonomously, building and coding robots, um, computer and AI, um, computer vision, something that we've been working on recently, and 3D printing. Um, we're constantly developing curricula. Uh, equipment and professional development to help support teachers here in Illinois and all over the country. Um, so we are really, really glad to have you with us today, um, specifically because you're digital educators. This is the Digital Educator Alliance, but also because we know you're passionate about teaching and passionate about informing the next generation of young learners. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about building a dynamic hybrid learning model 
And the reason why we're talking about building a dynamic hybrid learning model is because our world is um, extremely dynamic, um, is the way I would say that very, very politely. Um, things are changing really quickly. Um, in the past seven days, um, we've seen a dramatic shift in what our schools are telling us. It's going to be a priority. How we are logistically actually going to be instructing our students in the fall. Um, that is affecting the way that we're scheduling um, professional development. That's affecting the way that we're developing programs uh, for the fall. I just got a little bit of a note that my volume is lower. Um, hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, we are making adjustments to the way in which we're actually going to be able to deliver content and what kind of content we're going to deliver. Um, so in the development work that we've been doing, um, we think it's really important to help empower you as educators um, to consider options for having the flexibility um, that you're going to need, um, the ability to change and shift what you're doing in your STEM instruction based upon situations that may be out of our control. So with all of that being said, um, a great place to start is at the beginning. Um, I've talked about this a little bit before, just our philosophy and our goal. Um, which is really to empower you to prepare students for a more and more uncertain future. Um, one thing that we want to do is establish um, what our goals are for our next about 48-ish minutes. Uh, first, uh, we want to explore ways in which STEM courses can be delivered both in person and remotely. Um, we see that in a lot of situations, especially here in Illinois, um, plans for hybrid learning are coming out and they're aligned to the same generalized idea for in-class time, uh, remote learning time, and virtualized instruction. Um, but we know that all those situations may not be exactly the same depending on where you are, what school district, and of course, um, we don't know how things are going to change in the months to come. Uh, so we wanted to take a look at a few different scenarios and ways that we can make shifts and adjustments and plan um, in such a way where those adjustments are actually possible. Um, and that's what we're doing in the second portion, is developing that actual framework. Um, so with all that being said, um, if there are any questions that you might have, um, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll make sure that we pause and get an answer live on air. And I'll also make sure to give us some time at the end to address um, any other questions that you might have as well. Okay, so let's talk about hybrid learning, that word that we've been hearing for months and months on end and that we're getting confirmed more and more from our districts, which is gonna be the way in which we conduct instruction in the fall. What exactly do we mean when we say a hybrid learning model and what can that look like? with respect to STEM instruction in the fall. Well, a great place to begin when thinking about the hybrid learning model is to focus on hybrid learning priorities. Um, first and foremost, it's about student and staff wellness. Um, it is really, really difficult uh, to teach students and staff if we're worried about them actually being well. Um, and there are a bunch of other factors when we think about access to technology, access to food, um, dining, social emotional services, um, those things we're still trying to figure out for our students. But more than anything, um, that stuff goes to the, the wayside if we cannot um, figure out a way to keep you safe as teachers and our students safe as learners. So first and foremost, um, we got to make sure that you're doing okay, that you're physically well. Um, after that, um, we want to make sure that we're creating high quality learning experiences for all students. Um, that means considering different learning types, different modalities, um, our students who may have IEPs, our students who may be English as second language learners, um, our students who are special education. Um, we have to make sure that our hybrid model will support those students as well. And then lastly, we want to make sure that there are actual factors in place for our students who need high levels of physical support. Um, that part is going to be difficult. Um, we should not kid ourselves. We should not 
um, bare our heads in the mud on this, it's going to be really difficult for us to make sure that the students who need extra instructional time, um, the students who need extra time from us as instructors, as much as we're able to give them, are still able to re receive those supports. Um, building a model that allows some play with our time in a way that we can provide those resources to students, um, especially in the way things are going to shift, is a significant challenge, but it's something that we can do. And the key is thinking through what is possible to happen. Um, there are some logistical things that we can predict in our planning that allow us to accomplish as many of these goals as we can. So when we think about our actual individual courses that we're teaching, some of us are more generalized than teachers. I see some teachers who are uh, teaching cross-disciplinary um, subjects when we think about biology or even history. Um, when we think specifically of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in our learning goals, whether they are focused on Common Core Math or whether they're focused on NGSS or ISD um, or CSTA, whatever those goals are, um, how are we going to decide what goals we're going to shoot for with regards to flexibility? Well, it sounds really, really rote, it sounds really, really simple, but we need to think about what our learning objectives are. Um, without going into too much detail, um, think about your standards alignment, but also think about where your alignment is going to be and your learning objective is going to be with your other colleagues. Um, and that's not just standard alignment with our course design, um, that's thinking about even our lesson delivery. Um, I know I'm already preaching to the choir. Everybody on this call has been in multiple Zooms and Google Hangout meetings over the last couple of months figuring out how they're going to standardize your lesson delivery. Um, how are you going to establish your students' classroom expectations for the times that they're in class, for the times where you may be doing virtual instruction, and for the time that they will be working independently. I know those are three different modalities and those modalities will come up again um, as we jump into the latter parts of our webinar today, but it is critical, 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 critical um, for your student success that the way that they experience the delivery style of your course is not completely divorced from the delivery style of other teachers' courses. And a way that you can get to that place together is through collaboration. So if you haven't been working with your teachers to develop a master plan for uh, your in-person instruction, for your remote instruction, for your virtualized instruction, I'm highly encouraging you guys to work together on that right now. Um, your STEM subject matters are also going to be able to do some good work when we think about the cross-disciplinary instruction. Um, things that you're going to be doing and coding drones to fly autonomously are going to work really, really well when we think about fourth grade mathematics instruction, especially as a learning fractions and some algebra pre-concepts. Um, that is a really, really loose example, but it's directly on point where, where we're trying to go here. Um, as much as you can, and I know I'm hammering this point home, but as much as you can, work with the other teachers that are going to be seeing your kids so that you're all together on that same page. Um, for our administrators on the line, we know that you're doing that hard and good work as well, so we really appreciate what you're doing. So now that we have got this idea that we're going to be working together across our building with our other students instructors, um, the next thing that's really important for you as an instructor in STEM is making sure that whatever STEM instruction that you're using, especially the instructional technology for which your course is based, is something that's actually flexible to be used in those three modalities, in-person learning, remote learning, and virtual instruction. So what I've done is I've actually pulled a couple examples of those technologies that we use at Next Wave STEM um, and that I'm highlighting because of their particular flexibility. Um, part of the adjustment that we've had to make this uh, summer is um, 
basically our remote instructional model, our remote and virtual instructional model in the course of like a month. And if we jump into the way that machine feels like six years ago, but was actually the end of March, beginning of April, um, this question became really apparent for us because at Next Wave STEM, we believe on hands-on learning, something that is uh, explicitly tied to our ability to get our students not thinking only high conceptually, but thinking with their hands, thinking kinesthetically. Um, how can we provide that kind of experience for students if they are away from the classroom, if they are away from the equipment, if they are away from the technology? And the answer to that question lies in the ability to provide material support away from the classroom, lies for our ability to provide virtualized instruction and simulation. That idea of simulation is key to that learning as well. So if there's material support, if there's a way to actually get hands-on with some kind of physical equipment, whether that equipment is the actual computer device that I'm using to do um, computer-aided design for the 3D printer, or if that equipment is my software in the form of uh, hardware and software in the form of a tablet and or smartphone to allow me to simulate coding a drone. That becomes really, really important. But they live together. They live together not just in that we have to virtualize and simulate these experiences, but they have to be things that we are able to connect later on to our actual physical hard device. And I'll dig into that a little bit more. Um, but when we think about these two particular examples, when you think about drones or 3D printing, um, we think about things that, once again, can cross subject area uh, and have the ability to build in STEM concepts that we really want to see develop in our students and then connecting to our physical devices later on. So if we're flying drones autonomously, we're building up those computer science and skills that are critical for STEM, but we're also building up that cross talk in math skills, um, the ability for us to do things that work with algebra sense, to work with angles and measures and cardinality even, and then the problem solving skills um, and application of technology that we see inherent in engineering principles. Um, on the other side of that, we see also with 3D printing, where we're doing computer-aided design for those of us who may be interested in CTO and CTE education, um, and engineering design when we think about solving problems through a product design, engineering design process. Um, we've got the goods here. We've got the subject matter kind of screwed down and nailed down when it comes to the actual technologies. We just have to make sure that we're able to deliver them across a couple of different modalities. So now that we've kind of taken this 20,000 foot view of the technology, um, getting this bigger idea of um, the importance of working together in a team with our other instructors to make sure that the actual learning targets based on our standards or based on our community learning targets for our school are in line with each other, that we can talk and work through and build a plan for our lesson design and delivery um, in person, virtually, and remotely, um, then that's where we can do a little bit of our work now as a STEM instructor um, in our classrooms to build a framework that's really based on the flexibility. And um, what we'll do is we'll continue to use those technologies, drones and 3D printing, as our examples of how to do that. And this is where we kind of dig in um, to our different scenarios and what that might actually look like. Okay. So what we have identified, taking a look at probably five or six different proposed plans and some plans that are more finalized throughout the state of Illinois, is that there are overarching three scenarios, three most likely scenarios, three most plausible scenarios with regards to how our instruction may shift and change over time. Um, and I've kind of summarized them in quotation marks with respect to what we might call uh, the situation we may find ourselves in. Um, 
these are nothing official, but these are more so to guide our thinking with respect to what we have to consider when we lesson plan and making decisions about curricula and technology. The first is what I call um, the stay at home order. Um, in the scenario where we have a stay at home order occurring, um, what we've seen happen is that um, we have been able to dramatically decrease uh, the infection rate of uh, the virus in our general population in such a way that the risk of transmission in our schools is low enough that we're able to do instruction in school with some social distancing to little social distancing. I will admit to you right now that this scenario is the lowest, <laughs> is the lowest chance of happening here, but there is still a chance of this happening. Um, in this uh, scenario, uh, stay-at-home order, also known as the surge of infection, um, we have students who are in a mildly hybridized model. They're at school most of the time, um, vast majority of the time. And then we see a spike, a surge of infections for some reason. If that happens, we can expect that schools would no longer meet in person and would have to adjust to a completely remote learning scenario. Um, that means that we don't have things in control. We don't have pro protocols in place. Um, we see some smaller districts that have already made this decision to do complete remote learning or maybe even this district high schools, for example. Um, that's kind of the situation that we found ourselves in previously at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, if this happens or if this happens again, um, say sometime in the future, we want to be prepared for this scenario. The second scenario um, is this idea of the not ready to return scenario. Um, this is much closer to where we find the situation for more schools here in Illinois and across the country. Um, this scenario anticipates that our students who have been learning primarily remotely for the last few months, and as we transition more into the summer season, um, are still learning remotely, whether that's in summer school or support services or even their summer camps. Our students have become more and more acclimated to online remote learning and virtual instruction. If we find ourselves in a situation where the school has made that decision that we're not good to open right now, but we, like in that first scenario, get our transmission rate under control, if we are in a place where we can say, for example, have a vaccine that's developed and know that that vaccine has a high level of efficacy and are able to deliver that to a large part of our population, we could very quickly see a shift to more normalized learning in school. Um, that's something we, are, we wanna be prepared for. What does it look like for the curricula that I've selected, the lesson planning that I've done, the instruction that I've planned out with uh, the rest of our school community, what does it look like to stop and make that shift towards an instructional model that look like what we're used to when we've already begun our instruction? Are we throwing ideas about progress out of the window or are we ready to make that shift? That's a scenario we want to, um, we want to hold in our minds and we're going to call that the not ready to return scenario. The third scenario that most of us are really, really, really likely to experience in the fall is what we call the hybrid instruction. Uh, and it is what it sounds like. It is a mix, a blending, a hybrid of the situations of learning at home and learning at school. Um, many of us are going to see this in weekly situations uh, where we have a defined half of our population coming in for instruction during some days of the week another defined half of the population coming in for instruction on other days of the week. Uh, we may have some virtual instruction time as well interspersed for um, the entirety of our student population or for certain sections of the student population. And this varies from district to district and population to population. Um, for some of our high schoolers, they may be in school all the time or not at all. For some of our pre-Ks and Ks, they may be in school all the time. Um, but generally speaking, this hybrid model is the mixture, this idea of having to go back and forth in between.
And it's not so much about something drastically changing uh, with respect to transmission rates. It's about our schedule shifting and trying to keep students um, and staff as safe as possible. So these three scenarios of what we're going to be working through here. Um, surge or infections, uh, the not ready to return, and the hybrid instruction. Um, how can we make some great uh, or at least some really good decisions about what our um, actual instructional technology is going to be based on these three scenarios? Uh, this is where I get to get into the weeds a little bit and talk about what that looks like. So instructional flex and in drones. Um, we wanted to consider modalities and we want to consider scenarios. A uh, really, really useful way for you to do this is actually to create a, a nice big chart. Um, that chart is going to include um, these three situations. I'll actually back it up one slide. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, these three charts, um, these three scenarios. Um, what am I doing if there's a surge in infections? What am I doing if we're in a not ready to return situation? What am I doing if we're in the hybrid instruction model? And in those charts, what you're going to want to define is also um, the modality for virtualized instruction, the modality for remote learning, and the modality for in-person instruction. No, that's a, that's a mouthful, even coming out of my mouth, but that's something that we're going to follow up and make sure that you have resources for as well. Um, with regards to the surge of infections, um, thinking about instructional design specifically for the drone. Um, in a drone course um, that we've designed at <laughs> NextWave STEM, a focus isn't just on flying, but also in computer science, um, engineering design with regards to solving some complex simulated uh, problems, but also the ability to bring in these mathematical ideas so that the drone can be moved and executed in space. Uh, a surge of infection scenario imagines students who are in school in your classrooms coding and flying together in groups. Um, this is really more traditionalized instruction um, where you may be flying inside your school or out of your school. Um, you're engaging the community of the school in the flight. So that may look like the cross talk between your geography class and the way that you measure um, different land formations or the way that we do cartography in your drone class. Um, you're working together and bringing in, in place that kind of cross talk learning almost, almost, but not quite in the same vein of project-based learning. And um, if we find ourselves in a situation where we have to do the remote learning, well, what can my students do? In our case, it's understanding that you have software available. So some of the learning tasks, some of the performance tasks that you have built into a drone program, say you are simulating a drone delivery. We want to simulate delivering uh, a box from the office to the gym. That may be a flight of 20 feet, that may be a flight of 250 feet. Um, in a school scenario, we would actually program, we would troubleshoot, we would go through an engineering and coding design process to allow our physical drone to complete that flight. Remotely, what we're now able to do is actually make the shift where we can use our coding software to simulate the flight. On the devices that our students have at home, whether those are iPads or Chromebooks or um, traditional PCs or even their smartphones. Um, we want the technology, this is the technology that we use at NextWave STEM um, to be able to enter our code and then simulate the flight in a virtualized environment. So right there we see that we are able to make this flex, we're able to make this shift. And as we think about the scenarios that we might encounter on the not ready to return the hybridized instruction, we're also considering those scenarios as well. And our not ready to return situation where our students are remote, um, that means that we're engaging them digitally. Um, many of us are using um, Google services, whether that's G Suite and Google Classroom to engage students. Um, many of us are Office 365 schools um, where we're using things like Zoom and Microsoft Teams um, and Dropbox. Um, some of us are using other 
uh, learning management software systems. Um, that might be Schoology, that might be Moodle. Um, whatever that situation is, we need to understand that we're able to engage our students um, both in virtualized instruction, but also in our ability to assign this work through our application structure. So where in your in-person scenario, that curriculum, that course may have begun with an introduction, um, physical safety, uh, and then flying the physical drone, learning the computer science as you are flying and flying as you learn the computer science. Um, in a scenario where your students are starting remotely, um, we may begin with the actual computer science first and foremost, building in the mathematical skills and the simulation. And then knowing that we're going to be coming back to school in the future, now we have those physical devices at the school that we're able to connect our saved digital work to. Where we were previously simulating, we can now execute those flights in person in real time. Um, that's something that becomes a really, really powerful learning experience for our students because things that are simulated, digitized, that we might not be able to troubleshoot in a real world environment become that we can now compare to. So we've got this lesson and this continuous ongoing lesson in the difference between precision and accuracy and the delta, the difference in that space between what our physical machine is doing and what our digital simulation predicted that is really critical when we think especially of um, high school next generation engineering practices and standards. Um, that becomes a really, really powerful learning opportunity. Um, and then we think about what we're going to do most often. Um, and most often it's going to be about hybridized instruction. So that is that really awesome example um, where the first two days of the week, um, you're going to have your students, and this can be student block A, um, you're going to have your students who are physically in the classroom with you. So you're going to be able to do a lot of those things that you would do in a traditional setting, even if we're socially distanced. Um, we're going to be able to learn the coding basics because their devices are with them in socially distance. Um, their drones can be socially distanced, especially if we're flying those drones outdoors or in a larger classroom setting like a gym. Um, we're going to be able to learn our physical safety protocols and even build our ancillary measuring devices like wind socks that will teach us about drone ethics and flying the drone safely. Um, we transition then into our virtualized instruction um, where our instructor is actually teaching and engaging our students in building and coding the flight for their drone. And um, that's something that becomes extremely powerful because the students aren't left in the dark they're not put on the back burner. Um, something that some of us have been even practicing now is how to engage those 20, 25, sometimes 30, sometimes 12, um, but to engage those students in ways in which they're not checked out. And that back and forth with the technology that they have in their hand at home becomes really important. And then on the back end, where we have the remote learning, um, that's where we are hitting them with the different application and design scenarios. Um, really, really, really powerful because um, that's a chance for you as a teacher to kind of get hands off. And these moments don't become as much as assessments moments as feedback moments. Um, as they're programming and simulating the flight for their drone, the application, as they're simulating that drone delivery, um, and they're actually recording their screens and sharing those screen recordings onto Google Classroom for you to have feedback and assessment on. Um, we're able to see what their processes are. Um, and we know that that remote learning portion is gonna be a little bit difficult, but the technology is there to help us support the students to be able to submit remotely and then for us to remotely give that feedback on. And it becomes this situation that builds a particular set of tension because as we um, take the turn around next to the next week, we're able to take that virtualized remote work that we did and apply it into the physical scenario with the drone. Um, the work that students did on the Thursday and Friday planning 
a flight, we come back and then actually physically execute the flight and then are able to give our direct in-person feedback in the class. Um, so those three scenarios show that our instructional technology allows us to not only just continue to be hands-on at school, but continue to build an anticipation of hands-on work, a preparation for hands-on work, and a simulation of hands-on work and problem solving while we are virtualized um, instruction and remote for our students away from um, the class. Uh, definitely something that becomes really powerful and you can already see takes a decent amount of uphead, upfront planning on your end as an instructor, um, but is also extremely gratifying for your students because um, they're saying, okay, I actually am still learning about this emerging technology. Um, we think that's a really, really powerful experience for students to have. Um, let's quickly, because I can see the time is starting to run away from me only a little bit. Um, I am conscious of that hour. Um, we'll take another example from the 3D printing perspective. Now, another reason why we focus on the drones and the 3D printing um, in these separate instructional technologies is also because they kind of focus on some different cross um, material focuses as well where i might use drones to do cartography um, with respect to measuring distances um, and thinking about geography or even um, uh, geology depending on how uh, how rigorous a class you're planning for your high school students. Um, the 3D printer has an actual different modality, a different way in which we can explore these subjects in that it is making physical objects. Um, the process of 3D printing in and of itself um, is something that allows our students to learn multiple skills specifically in the digital science space, um, computer-aided design, um, machine input, output and interface, especially when we think about this process of slicing, um, taking your 3D design and turning it into something your machine can actually read. Uh, and then the actual production process. Um, those things all become these really powerful learning moments. Um, but of course we have to ask ourselves, okay, I've invested in the 3D printer, our school has invested, we have this filament sitting in my school gathering dust, um, or I don't know how to use a 3D printer, but uh, we don't want to have it continue to be a very large coat rack in my classroom. What can I do to get my students really engaged? Well, let's take a look at our three scenarios once again. I'm thinking about what our in-person instruction is going to look like, what our remote learning is going to look like, and what that virtualized modality will also look like. And the surge of infection scenario. Um, once again, that's where we have more routine in-person instruction, very unlikely that'll be the case for many of us, but for our students who are in the classroom with us, and then there's a surge and they will have to go back to a remote learning scenario. Um, 3D printing uh, is actually a three-step process, uh, and those processes can be summarized in three words, design, slice, and print. Um, if our students are with us in class, of course, they're going to have to learn how to design first. We just don't want some random object to spit off the printer or uh, for those of us who have done 3D printing before, the random spaghetti monster to come off of the printer. Um, we want to uh, start to learn the design skill. That's something our students are usually doing in person with us as instructors and also the initiation and the engineering design process. Um, we're not just using a 3D printer to print for no reason. Um, we're actually going to use this to produce an object, solve a problem. Um, that work, whether it's project-based or traditional curricula, like what we do at Next Wave STEM, um, begins in the classroom. But if we have that surge and students have to be removed um, to do remote learning, virtual instruction can continue because um, our students have the ability to dialogue with you as an instructor and dialogue with their peers and virtualize instruction or even through their LMS towards the engineering design goals. Uh, they're still able to actually design and work with the software through machines that they have at home. Um, and they're able to do that because the software that we use for design 
Tinkercad is cloud-based. All you need is an internet connection. Um, we absolutely recognize that could be a problem for some of our students who don't have access to stable internet. Um, and there are gonna be support systems put in place either via library or um, by uh, resources made available through your districts that will help close the gap. But if we can get the devices and internet connection to the students, they have the ability to continue the design. And when we get to that portion, that part where it's important for us to actually produce the physical object to do the 3D printing, you've got a couple different options there. For our instructors, for the staff that may still be able to physically go into the school, um, 3D printing becomes pretty easy. Um, you run your printer um, and you walk away from your printer, depending on how large the batch, the multiple items coming off your printer are at one time. And those are items that can be um, picked up by students mobily. It can be as simple as coming to the school, rolling down a window, here's your 3D print, um, here are your other materials that you may be getting from the school. And also, um, there are a plethora of services that provide distance 3D printing. Um, submitting the designs that your students have made uh, and then actually printing the design on their printer and sending to your students. Um, that becomes a very, very easy transition to make. In the not ready to return scenario, um, where we are remote learning for our students and then in the future we see something like a vaccine once again um, and our students return to school. Um, what we would see there is really your virtualized instruction being the goal. Um, you're starting with teaching your students the skills um, with respect to Tinkercad. This is screen share and students once again signed in on their end. Um, and also something that's really amazing on their end is knowing in the future, if we know that they're coming back to their physical printer, um, making the slicing software available to them as well. Um, that becomes the actual 3D printing simulation. Um, the slicer allows our students to see um, in sped up time and in, in, in what you might even consider time lapse, um, the way that the physical machine will produce the 3D print um, becomes a really, really powerful learning model, builds anticipation for our students, allows us to iterate and work towards the engineering goals. And then when we get back into the classroom, um, wham, bam, printer is, is working maybe working a little bit over time, but our objects are coming up that printing for us to post-process, um, to test and to iterate on. So we see kind of the scenario flipped from that surge of infections to um, not ready to return. In the hybrid instruction, this becomes really, really fun, um, especially for uh, your students, because once again, we're building this anticipation of the big payoff. Um, and this is something that we've actually done at Next Wave STEM over the course of the summer in small quantity, where our students have really experienced uh, and said that they've had a lot of fun with our virtualized instruction towards 3D printing. Um, so you come in, you are with your group A and their social distance, but they've got their machines and you're starting with the engineering design process. They're also building those digital learning skills, those digital design skills, I should say, um, design, in 3D. Um, and that in and of itself is going to be a really, really, really exciting thing for your students who especially have not done digital design for and becomes a really big shift in the kind of work they've been doing digitally thus far because of COVID, um, which has been staring at videos and reading articles and filling in forms and filling in worksheets. This becomes a really, really different way for them to engage the digital space with 3D design. But then we make that shift towards virtualized learning. And virtualized learning, that's once again, instruction from you showing students and having them show back and share and even collaborate, um, not quite real time, but collaborate in physical design of their objects um, while they are working in their uh, or on their machines while they're at home away from the classroom. Uh, this once again becomes really, really exciting because that ideation between you, that exchange between you and 
them in between them and their peers as they're designing and working towards a design solution um, is exactly what the engineering design process is like and actually mirrors what the 3D printing industry looks like right now. So in uh, this not too happy but fortunate kind of way, our students are being put in these scenarios where they're going to be working in the ways in which they will work in industry in that virtualized learning. And then in the remote learning, um, that's actually reaching towards those design goals. Um, can you get your object designed? Can you get it sliced for your particular printer in such a way that when we come back for your next round of in-person design, we can get our printer running? So we see this, this loop now of um, learning skills, um, collaborating in the virtualized instruction, um, working towards the design goals and the design process, whether that is um, understanding our constraints and defining our constraints, whether that is ideating our solutions or doing our research, whether that is design and not limited to, but includes printing. Um, can we, do that remotely or can we build up the anticipation to come back again in that, in that next week, that next cycle to accomplish those tasks together. Um, the technology built in with what you have available on the back end uh, of your LMS allows for that to happen. So I know we kind of really got into the weeds there, but it's important to think about um, what we see happening Um, that gives us flexibility. Um, that flexibility was kind of there before, but now we're going to be really intentional about building that into the future of the way that we're teaching, at least in the immediate future. So here's what an example less progression looks like, um, especially in that virtualized session, because that's really kind of the big question that we've been getting. Um, what will my virtual instructor do on the day or days in which they're doing instruction. Well, some of this blends in with our remote work as well, but it could be as simple as whole group live instruction. Um, that's your Zoom call with your class of 25. Um, and then our whole group live collaboration. Um, this is breakout rooms, moderated discussions with the instructor, sharing screens, um, getting input and feedback and adjusting in real time. Um, small group collaboration happens there as well in kind of that same way. And um, can even be diversified even more in your group chat, sharing links, sharing memes, sharing pictures. Those things become really powerful instructional moments, especially in the engineering design process, which is um, really inherent to teamwork. Um, we may come back and do greater exploration and greater elaboration um, with that whole group and the instructor. Again, that may be the way that we close out that day. And then we moved more towards that remote work um, where students are going to um, continue to work, to tweak designs, to tweak code, um, and then elaborate by submitting via the Google Classroom or LMS. And then there's that feedback moment once again that you have um, as an instructor. Um, that becomes a really, really powerful opportunity for um, you and uh, for our students. And of course, this isn't super technical support on your uh, LMS, whether that's Google Classroom or from uh, any particular perspective that you may be using um, communication software with your students. Uh, I cannot say this enough, um, become a master. Become a master at Moodle, become a master at Blackboard, become a master at Canvas, um, become a master at Google Classroom. These tools are much, 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 uh, three muches more powerful than you may realize. The ability to collaborate with your students and get clever in the way that we collaborate with these file types um, is going to be really, really key. Um, for example, many of us may not know, but the 3D printing files that your students actually generate, those STL files, are Google Classroom compatible, are Google Drive compatible. So we do not want to leave you out in the cold here. 
um, we want you to really, uh, really, really, really encourage you to become masters of your LMS. This will make your life easier. This will make your students' lives easier as well. So how can Next Wave STEM help? Uh, a couple different ways. Um, we are doing this webinar today with our partnership with IDEA, but we are getting into some more um, dynamic and some more interesting, well, not more interesting, but some different topics with regards to STEM education. Um, and those are also free PD sessions. Check us out at uh, nextwavestem.com to learn more about those. Um, we are also um, more for our out of school time, but yes, even for our in school time partners, um, doing that virtualized instruction. Um, that means that we have options where we can provide you with the equipment. Um, we can also provide your students with the equipment. Um, we are an all-in-one solution. That means equipment, training for ins your instructors or using our own instructors. Um, once again, reach out to us at nextwavestem.com if you're interested and we can tell, tell you a little bit more about that as well. And it is really important that you once again consider what your curriculum is going to be for the fall. Um, and that it has the flexibility to go in person or remote. Um, if you want to learn more about our curriculum or even see a sample of what we've got going on, um, once again, reach out to us at nextwavestem.com. Um, and I do want to pause now for questions. I was able to come in at a reasonable time here, 1254. So if you've got questions, I know our chat is open for questions. This is the part where I take a breath. <laughs> well, we do have a couple of comments here. Love hearing about the other platforms to become a master at. Yes. Um, and this is, once again, um, something that your colleagues are going to be able to help you out with uh, a little bit more. Um, some of your colleagues may have experience with Tinkercad and setting up a Tinkercad classroom that integrates seamlessly into your Google Classroom accounts. Um, many, many, many of our instructors who are interested in 3D printing um, and may know about designing Tinkercad may not know about that particular functionality. So that's important to share that information, but also um, master the platform. And that becomes really, really useful as you're building your instruction down the line. Uh, any suggestions for webinars for becoming a master at Google Classroom? Uh, really great question. Uh, there is uh, a company, MobileMind, that uh, does some Google Classroom work. Um, check them out. Um, but that's something we're going to have to follow up more about um, with you as well. That's something that we are also exploring um, getting into at Next Wave STEM. So um, keep your ears open for that. Uh, another good question here. What are some collaboration techniques you would recommend for students working in a hybrid model? Oh, yes. Uh, huge fan of our Google and Google Slides. Um, something that I encourage, um, and this is a little trick here, but it's really useful for you as a teacher. Um, we're used to um, teachers assigning that Google Doc, the, the Word, document and having them juggle 30 of those with our different students working in them or sharing one Google Doc and having 30 students working with those and that can become really copious, really, really um, cumbersome really quickly. Um, let's use slides instead. Um, we can have a slide of uh, Google Slides um, and individual slides for each of our students. Our students may have slides aside by number according to their place on your class roster and they may be working those slides together instead. And that's something that you can flip back and forth um, in between really easily based upon what your students are doing. Um, but also that allows your students to kind of peek and get some uh, ideas about what's happening in other students' workflows as well. Um, and the same kind of thing can happen in Google Sheets. I know uh, most of us will not even touch Google Sheets for the majority of the time that we're doing our instruction. Um, but let's kind of remove this paradigm where students are working in their individual silos 
and create an actual graphical expression, which is what slides is, that allows our students to actually feel like they're contributing to a larger um, group in a subsection of work. And the great thing about that is that you can throw anything in those. It can be text, it can be drawings, it can be screenshots of the work that they're currently doing. Um, if it can be sketches through Google Draw, or just live right into the slide. So um, that is probably my fast tip, my quick tip there about collaboration. Um, instead of it having having them do it in docs, slides. So that's that's one of my big favorite ones. Well, I definitely know that we're getting close to the wire there. So I want to make sure that you can also reach out to me. Uh, once again, my name is Desmond Martin. Uh, I am the program coordinator at Next Wave STEM. Uh, you can absolutely reach out to me via email. Um, Desmond at nextwavestem.com. We keep it really easy. You can find uh, Next Wave STEM on most uh, social media platforms as well, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. I say most because we're not on TikTok. I am not ticking. I am not talking. Uh, I, we have a new fellow who started with Next Wave STEM. Maybe he can do that, but that's not for me. Uh, and something uh, that I'm going to encourage everyone to do is um, to continue to build your skill set. Uh, we know it's difficult. We know it's tough. We know it's stressful right now, but continue to work at it and you will get better and your teachers will really, really uh, or your students will really, really appreciate it. Um, so uh, Jenna is back on. Uh, thanks again for having us. I'm going to turn it back over to her. Awesome. Thank you so much, Desmond. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm just going to answer two of the last questions that came in. Um, will this be archived? Yes, I'm going to post um, in a second where you can find all of our previous Wednesday webinars, which also goes to Rian's um, comment about our YouTube channel. So we do, um, during the height of COVID in March, we did do um, a ton of um, sessions that were Google sessions, Apple sessions, Microsoft sessions, beyond, besides all of the other um, webinars that we were running at the time. So um, you'll find all of those webinars on our Wednesday webinar page, which I will post the link in just a second here. Um, I'm also going to attach in this post the link for today's PDHs. Um, so you've got three things that just came across. The link for today's PDHs, where you can find all of our Wednesday webinars, and this one will be archived and posted there um, no later than tomorrow morning as well. And then also, if you want to register for future IDEA events like the one that's on the screen right now, next week's Wednesday webinar is with another partner of ours, Book Creator. And it's going to be about their new offerings with Book Creator. So it's the Book Creator You Never Knew and more. Um, so those have been fantastic webinars as well. And we would love for you to check that out. Just go ahead and um, register at that ideaillinois.org slash calendar um, page. And you can find the Book Creator um, webinar as well as other things that we've got going on right now. Um, and that's it. So... I think that's it on the questions. Um, the PDH will be available through midnight tonight. Again, if you're just looking for a certificate of completion, if you're not an Illinois educator, go ahead, fill that out, and we'll shoot you back that certificate of completion as well. So Desmond, um, once again, as always, thank you so much. Um, very informative. Um, I think it comes at a good time when everybody's just kind of deciding what they're going to do this fall. So good luck to all of you. Um, hopefully, things go your way um, as all of your schools make their announcements in the next week or two. And um, good luck this fall. And hopefully we'll see you guys at other um, IDEA events very soon. So thanks so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.